I don't know about you guys, but I probably want to get to the pub, so we'll just get started. Um, as mentioned before, this is Web App, uh, Web Security, Web App Security Open Style. Um, there are many talks like this, but this one is mine, and this is last minute. Uh, basically, I got asked to do this talk on Monday, so it's a little bit rushed, the slides are a little bit draft, um, it hasn't been rehearsed, and I'm a little bit nervous. A little bit about me, I'm based in Wellington. I uh, am a freelance security consultant, which is basically translation to white hat sellout. Um, I hack banks and stuff for a living, and I have a background in system administration as well. So over the years, I've worked for a bunch of fine companies um, and some not so fine companies. I've uh, committed major fuck ups on all of them. The most increasing was definitely New World when I was the veggie guy stacking the apples and uh, four crates came down on an old lady. And I got my first formal, formal warning in the workplace. It was pretty awesome. So the question that I have today is, is, is a rather simple one, and that is what do LCA 2010, ACDC, Sunshine, OWASP, Coffee, OSSTMM, and Fatherhood have in common? It's a very strange question, I know, but it's the only thing I could think to put on a slide at the time. <laughs> and the answer is this. They all contributed to me winning a free ticket to this conference. Um, and throughout this talk, I hope to answer that question with a few, few additional bits and pieces. But to understand why I'm here, I really just need to set the scene. Basically, Glenn Foster, who's the guy that was one of the organizers of the conference, came charging up to me on Monday afternoon and said, Pipes, can you give a talk? And I said, OK, what about? And he gave me this blank look, like, what the fuck, dude? I need to answer that question. And I, my initial answer was no, because I haven't got any new research, and everything that I've been doing is kind of up in the air because of I'm a father of two, and I haven't really been focused for the last year, but I thought, you know, what has Glenn done for me lately? He hasn't done much, right? He's only contributed to GNOME, like been product manager on Open Solaris, ran a kick-ass software freedom day, and contributed to this conference. So I changed my mind and thought the least I can do is try to put this talk together for the G-Man, and this is this talk. So to understand why this material is so weak would simply come down to I spend months on my research. I spend months and months and months knowing a subject, learning a subject. And to be honest, to win this free ticket, I spent about four hours over an eight-hour period. Um, and like all good CSI shows, there's a timeline. So to set the scene, I was kicking up in Paraparama. It was about 5.30 on Father's Day last year. And um, the, the screaming kid woke me up, and I kind of went over and back to sleep and had a nice breakfast and did what every father does on Father's Day, and that's debate the wearing of pants. It's a very critical subject. Um, and I kicked the kids out with the wife, they disappeared off to their grandparents and I had the entire house to my, myself so I retired to my office. This is my office, you can kind of sort of see the beach and there's kind of like a backyard and you know, Linux geeks are kicking down this part somewhere. So my office is my backyard, the sun was shining, it was a beautiful day, I think it was about 17 degrees which for Wellington is pretty good. Um, and I was enjoying it and listening to some ACDC as you do and I was surfing the net. And I was browsing the net and I was looking up the LCA. I think uh, the reason why I went there was the system in Minicomp was being announced by Mad Duck and I was checking that out. And I carried on surfing the net as I do in my office. Serious business, hard work. Um, and browsing websites and web applications as I always do. And as you can tell, the screenshot was taken last night when I refined these slides. But, you know, it's, censorship on the internet is serious business. If you haven't actually looked into it, maybe you should. So I'll see if in the net and found myself back here. And I was looking at it going, free. Quite frankly, free shit rules. So I decided they have a competition. It's a website. Maybe I can have a crack at it. I've never won anything in my life. I think I won a CD off 2XXFM when I was like 12. So I decided to have a crack at it. And to do that, I had to come up with a bit of strategy, a bit of methodology. And that was which path to take. Because if you go back to the original news post, they had a unique hash in the URL. And they said, basically, you need to find the unique hash to find the images for each year. So I was standing in, in, in a sort of fork. I could either go down the road of cracking the hash, or I could go down the road of hacking the website. And quite frankly, I suck at technology. I'm terrible at cracking. So I skipped the hash idea and decided to go to number two, because how hard can it be? So I made some assumptions. These assumptions were simple. The first is that I guessed that Francois and the LCA organizers didn't want me to root the server. Um, that the production instance was up and running and that was what I was targeting, so I decided no, no, no attack in the CMS. 
Um, I assumed that not everything would be in plain sight. I figured that for you know an eight hundred dollar ticket or whatever it was, seven hundred and eighty, I can't remember. Um, I was going to have to put in a little bit of effort. So I was looking at having a little bit of background on this stuff. I decided to keep a really simple focus. I decided that there's going to be some surface vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities being the images. I also decided that you know understanding and just gathering some information about the target would be a good idea. And to do that, we do mir mirroring of the site and fingerprinting, which I'll come to shortly. And also supporting services, because one of the things, as we know, is a website relies on a number of services. You need to be able to transfer files to it. You need to be able to look it up on the internet, the NS resolve. And occasionally, it likes to send you emails with your passwords. So we decided, I decided that was a good, good place to sort of target. And to do that, I needed a methodology. And this is one of two uh, open methodologies that I want to share with you today. Um, the main one is sort of this one. This is OWASP, which is the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, and OWASP is a, it's been around about 10 years, and it's an initiative by developers and hackers alike, and hackers in the security term, not, not sort of the free open term, to share some information. Because basically what was happening is a lot of security professionals were out there and beating the corporates down. They were smashing every web project that came out. And the feedback, the feedback that came back every time was, well, we didn't know about that. We didn't know about XML injection or reflection attacks or various other sort of techniques. So they came up with OWASP, and they started a couple of projects. And the first was Top 10, which is um, every couple of years they refine and release the Top 10, which is the Top 10 vulnerabilities that people are seeing on websites day in, day out. And they're everything you'd expect, injection vulnerabilities and reflection, like cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and cross-domain requests and all the sort of bits and pieces. Uh, configuration issues are usually top of the game. And so I think there's a RC2 of the 2010 out now, which I haven't actually looked at, but I think there's a few changes in there. The other thing they publish is a development guide. Basically, they sat down with developers and they said, well, how can we word this in a way that people can understand? How can they read it while they're developing the code rather than dealing with it later on? And so they released the development guide. They uh, have a smooth, few small projects such as WebGoat and WebScarab, which uh, WebGoat uh, provides uh, vulnerable website that you can hack while you're learning to understand the vulnerability and working through the development and testing guides. And WebScarab's a tool that assists you. It's basically a proxy between your browser and allows interception while you're testing web applications. Um, the one that we're going to focus on today is the testing guides, but I will do a quick mention on SAPI, which is the Enhanced Security API Project. If you haven't seen this, this project is cool. Basically what they've done is they've written Pluggable APIs for all common languages. This is PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby. Uh, I think there's Haskell. There's a couple of others. Java, ASP.NET. But basically what it is, it's an effort to provide an API that when you punch into your web application, it's easy and extendable, will prevent, by default, the top 10 vulnerabilities at a minimum that we see at OWASP. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty good, pretty good effort. Um, but as I say, the thing that I wanted to share really today is the testing guide. And this is an open document. It's under the Creative Commons share alike. Um, and basically what it is, it's 349 pages on how to rip apart a web application as a tester. And it does it by breaking it down into obvious sort of categories. And the ones that I've underlined in this slide are the ones that I came through my mind when I was looking at this free ticket problem. Because most of these are relatively passive attacks. There's no injection vulnerabilities in this stuff. There's no sort of malicious way to brute force passwords and bypass captures. It is basically looking at the surface level of the application and understanding where they've uh, made mistakes. So the guide is really good. It's really easy to read. Version 3 is out now. Um, it's been in development for a long time. I've had the pleasure of uh, reviewing it several times. And um, it's a great piece of documentation. The second thing I wanted to introduce today is the OSS TMM which is lesser known than the OWASP guides, but it's basically uh, the open source testing methodology manual, security testing methodology manual. Yeah. And there's a lot of argument about exactly how open this is, but there is a free document that you can download and you can modify it, and it is under a, a, a kind of free license. But um, this is more focused away from the web application and looks at the role of pen testing and attacking networks. So it's a slightly lesser document because the idea is for each of the subcategories, they introduce them, they show how to measure them, which is very important when you're security testing. 
And they also go out and say, um, you know, we're about to go get some further knowledge and further technical details. So, a quick look at our target. Our target is a website. It's as simple as that. You load it in your browser, it loads, it has fancy conference information, it has schedule changes when dudes come in to talk about security instead of free and open source software. But it basically is a really, on the surface, quite a, quite a small target. So I needed a strategy, and the first thing, as I said, we go back to the information gathering. You really need to understand your target. So the first thing I did was just browse the site. And I found the first image. Um, I was just clicking through, browse, browse, trying to understand the structure. How does this site work? What's it generated? Is it fast? Is it slow? Do some pages load faster than others? Is there a database on the back end? Is the content consistent? Are there any errors? But I found my first token, so that was, that was pretty simple. So I carried on browsing the site, and the MediaWiki instance on LCA 2010 was powered by a penguin, so I found my second image. And so this was kind of, you know, 10 minutes of fluffing around, just, just observing and looking at the application. But it's not really an in-depth view, even for a passive attack. It's not really too in-depth. So I had to mirror the site. And this is an old habit. This is one of the first things they suggest you do in the OWASP manual and the OSS TMM and the web section that's coming out shortly. Um, and the reason for it that I do it personally is there's a, there's a mentor of mine and a guy that taught me to do a lot of my work, and his name's Brett Moore. And if you've ever met Brett, he's um, quite a scary hacker. Basically what he does is he learns as much about the target as possible. He patiently sits and watches it. Then from hell on earth, he just unleashes on the application or the target and destroys it. So the first thing that he does every single time on a web app is mirror. So that's a habit that I got on into. And we're looking for consistency issues. Are there errors? How long does it take? How many third parties are sort of connecting in and out of this? Um, is there any sort of obvious API stuff? So they have got FCK editor. Um, and so just, just kind of set WGET going. Went and got a cup of coffee, chilled out. I had a look at the request sizes because obviously uh, if you've got dynamic generation of 404 error pages and then the same size cross and you know that you've struck an error or you've led off on the wrong path. But more and more, I just kind of fired up WGET because that's what elite hackers do. So um, when I was working on this talk, I thought that there was actually a few more different vulnerabilities that correlated to the... Um, OWASP manual and the OSS team in than I originally remembered. And basically all I found out is that I'm okay at grip. I can get my grip on like no one's business. So here's a top grip tip, which seems to amaze people even now and then when I do it, and that's to colorize grip, um, which you'll find in the next slide came in really handy. So I fired up my grip, searching for the first year, which was 1999. And obviously I got a hit back straight away. You'll see the image, source, blur, and the slide map. So obviously when I was surfing the site, I missed the slide map. Okay, that's cool. So I've now got a three character refine on my grip there. I put in LCA and I started 2001. I think 2000 wasn't the conference or something. But, and yep, sure enough, I uh, managed to make it through in the about history, which I'd missed when I was browsing the site. And 2008, which uh, was in the CSS. Now, one of the things that developers are, are pretty good at are including other people's work, right? You don't want to have to go through and rejig everything and, re -write, re and reinvent the wheel and rewrite services and systems and designs. And so what they, what, one of the common issues that is pointed out in the OWASP manual is basically the fact that include files, like always check out and examine include files because the chances are is that if there's a vulnerability in one, it's been included from somewhere else. So I ran on that assumption after seeing the CSS, and I thought, what if I do a search across the JavaScript files? And um, basically, you'll see there, they, they did a sneaky thing where they put a space between 200 and 5 and 2005. Um, but because I was running on a lesser grip with my elite grip skills, um, I managed to find that one in the include in the JS files. So, at this stage, I know my grep skills and my wget skills and my ability to find images on websites is pretty shit hot. <coughs> and there's another trick that's quite common, and this is a, and another common flaw that many, many websites still fall for today. And in fact, it's the first thing in OWASP information gathering section that they tell you to do, and that's to check the robots.txt file, because what people generally do is slap in a disallow, disallow slash admin. 
disallow this, disallow super admin functionality. And so I thought, well, you know, the guide said to do it, and why not? And sure enough, 2003 existed as a comment, but I would have put it as a disallow to make it more realistic. But I think his Francois was tired. I think they did this like late on a Thursday night and announced it on the Friday. So at this point, I had to go back to browsing the website. There was no more obvious images, strings I could grip. Uh, there was no more obvious includes. There was no more. There was just nothing on the surface. Um, so I was still out in the sun, and I was still drinking my coffee, and I was still enjoying it. So I started re-looking over the website. And when I was looking across the website, this funny little thing spotted me, which is Francois working on the mini comps, the websites, and Zookeeper. And I never, ever heard of Zookeeper, so I decided to check out what Zookeeper was. And free and open source software is an absolutely wonderful thing because we share the source code with everyone around us to hack on, and we also share the source code with the attackers, such as myself. So having a quick Google on Zookeeper and having a quick look at the launch pad, I found that they branched the LCA website, the LCA Zookeeper CMS, for 2010. So I thought I'd, I'd uh, have a quick look at that and check it out. This is a typical terminal session of mine. Um, basically what you do is, I didn't know this, but the bizarre, 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 I can't, don't even know how to pronounce it, um, allows you to check out off Launchpad. So I downloaded the, the code and sort of had a look over it. And because we haven't run grep for a few slides, um, I fired up grep and sure enough, 2002. So there is a very valuable lesson here, and that is if you have a look at the source code, you'll find a lot of interesting bugs. You'll find a lot of interesting commits, and you'll find that developers often make the mistake of committing security patches before they actually go into a release. That's a very common mistake. And attackers spend a lot of time looking at this. Mozilla lent this the hard way. Drupal lent this the hard way. Um, many major projects have lent this the hard way. And I think on the Mozilla one was the first one, and a guy called HD Moore basically wrote a bash script just to check the source code and the bug reports every day to find vulnerabilities. And I think he had a keyword of crash on it. Um, and he had Firefox, quote, zero day because the patch hadn't been pushed into a release. Um, so yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting trick, and it is being used by attackers. I just realized I'm way ahead of time. So it's going to be a real short session, and we can get to signing some PGP feeds. But then I was stumped. I did the usual things. I fired up search engines. Remember, I'm trying to be passive here. I checked out the search engine to see if there was anything cached by a search engine that once existed, no longer existed, or you know, various things that I'd missed. I kind of rummaged through, and I did a, did a test on SMTP to thought maybe they put the version string to, to a token, and um, tried the year. I can't remember what, exactly which year I was hunting at this stage, but I tried the year at LCA 2010, and that bounced back. And, I tried checking the version of DNS because I thought maybe they set the version of DNS on there. and I didn't, didn't have much luck at all, and I was running out of ideas. And One thing struck me is, like, you know, an old, old man kind of bit on my shoulder back in the ghosty image and said, keep it simple, stupid. And this is a philosophy that I, I try to adhere to, but I lose all the time. And sure enough, what if I did a search for a straight text record? If I stopped being smart and trying to steal the, the zone file or check the versioning and just did a search for straight text. So it looks like another sort of hash that I was after. So I fired it up, brick forced, and I think it was 2004 or something like that. I honestly can't remember. There's a very technical term we use in security, and that is face palm. It's derived from head desk, and that is when you slap your hand into your forehead and it hurts because you realize that you've been a complete dumbass. And this particular face palm for me came 18 minutes after I'd found the, the ninth token. And I was sitting there and I was looking at it going, I just can't see 2009, I can't see it anywhere. The hell is wrong with me? I just can't see it anywhere. And I was vigorously looking through my notes and looking at the OWASP and OCS team and I'm like, if this is a passive attack, you know, don't go and owning the CMS so that you can figure out where it is. And not that Zookeeper has any bucks, but <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was really struggling with it. And then, sure enough, can you guys read that? If you took the example URL from the news article and you changed 2010 to 2009, you got the 2009 token. The obvious. 
which is, quite frankly, a business logic bypass. You'll see this all the time in websites. You'll see them say, uh, we're going to do uh, a login process or a sign-up process, and, and the URL's got slash step one. So you click your details, and you click it, and go slash step two. What if I go step five? And just skip the rest, skip validation, skip my email setup. And it's, it's quite common, and you see it all the time, especially within a corporate applications for some reason, which is quite ironic. But and the other 10 tokens. Uh, that was my IRC announcement. And I felt real bad for the guy, I think his name was AJ, who had, um, who had nine tokens at the time but didn't have the launch pad token and actually checked out the code. Uh, but he checked out the wrong branch, I think. So, yeah, that was, um, that was an interesting exercise. So the bottom line is, is the fact that when people do sit about looking at applications and looking at systems and, and trying to find, even if it's a little exercise like this for a free ticket to a conference, which they then rope you into speaking at, um, it's, there is a methodology behind it. I mean, even attackers, even the, like, you know, the, the real, the, the people that are doing this for bad have methodologies. They have a process they run through, whether it's in their mind or on paper, it exists. So I think it's really important for people to understand and recognize that these aren't random attacks. There is a thinking process and there is a thought process behind trying to obtain information or attack a website or attack systems. And fortunately for us, there's been some very clever people in the world document these processes and share them with us in a, in a license, a document format and licenses that we can use. Um, I strongly involve, uh, encourage you to check out OWASP. I'm, I'm, I really enjoy the OWASP project. It's um, a strange, um, I can't think of any other example on the planet at the moment where you guys and girls actively working together to try to make a better um, dealio. Basically, there's a big disconnect between um, the way that it works. So, and the OSS TMM is a really good starting point if you're not used to attacking networks. So, and that's actually it, which is really fast. Sorry. Um, any questions? Ah, uh, yeah, I can try. Okay, this thing works now. So if anyone's got a question, I'll... You, you briefly mentioned XML injections. Uh -huh. So how, how would... Is that sort of an AJAX attack? Or, or what... what uh, how would one structure an attack like that? More web service attack. So what you find is that a lot of applications now rely on uh, third-party systems, and we're using web technology like XML, RPC, and other sort of API communications to talk to each other. And uh, we focus a lot on SQL injection and scripting language attacks and command language attacks, but XML and LDAP and all these sort of other technologies we use to communicate with other systems can be injected in just as easily. Um, so it's more focused towards attacking the web service, whether via an application or the web service directly. Yeah. So it's quite, it's quite a common vulnerability you'll find more and more and more. Um, when it first got announced, no one cared. I think it was presented at DEF CON back like a number of years ago, and no one cared at all because, well, who ran XML? And Ajax wasn't really on the picture, or no services out to third parties, and Flickr didn't have an API, and Google didn't have a million APIs. Um, so no one really paid any attention to it, whereas now the amount of sites that interact over HTTP but via XML is, is quite extensive, so it's only quite a common vector. Um, <clears throat> that was awesome, thank you. A really good fill-in talk, actually. I really enjoyed it. Um, you checked out uh, Zookeeper, and mm -hmm. having run this conference before and having dealt with Zookeeper, I did have to giggle when you said there's no bugs in it. Um, did you get a chance to have a look, you know, while you were doing what you're doing, did you look at some of the stuff and so, have you reported back yeah, any useful stuff? Yeah, um, at the moment there's a couple of potential bugs that I saw reading the latest source that was on the USB key, um, and I can assure you Francois will get those. Excellent, thank you. Any other question? Uh, thanks, you might as well go sign some keys and drink some beers. Thanks a lot. Uh.